I'm Richard Abermankel, Professor of Political Science and Integrated Liberal Studies here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I am also the director of the study, uh, of the Center for the Study of Liberal Democracy, which is a think tank on campus that sponsors events like this one. And this particular event is the seventh in a lecture series uh, that we created this semester on conservative thought. So last week, we um, inquired into the relationship between conservatism and Catholic social teaching. And I think for all of us, the jury is still out on that one. Um, and this week, we're exploring a different approach to conservatism in the writings of Michael Oakshaw. And to lead this discussion, I would like to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Corey. Professor Corey is an associate professor of political science and director of the honors program at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. She's the author of the book, Michael Oakshaw on Religion, Aesthetics, and Politics. Her writing has appeared in a variety of popular and scholarly journals, including First Things, National Affairs, Wall Street Journal, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. She received a bachelor's in classics from Oberlin College and a master's and doctoral degrees in art history and political science from Louisiana State University. She serves on the board of directors of the Institute on Religion and Public Life, which is the publisher of First Things. Please join me in welcoming to Madison, Dr. Elizabeth Corwin. Thank you very much, Rick. And it's really a pleasure to be here and to see you all and to know that you have read or presumably have read Michael Oakshot's essays um, and his my period this, uh, this week. I thought what I would do was would be to begin by giving some prepared remarks and then, as I guess is the custom here, open it up to questions and we can have a rather more free-ranging conversation about the ideas that, uh, that Oakshot presents. Oakshot is, for those of you who um, don't know, the author of this, uh, probably the most famous book in the United States is Rationalism and Politics which is a collection of essays he wrote over the course of many years. He also wrote two large books, which you could be glad that we didn't assign you. They're very tough going. One was at the beginning of his life. It's called Experience and Its Modes. Uh, it was a work of British idealism. Uh, and he, he sets out the idea of modes, which we may end up talking about in this class. And his final book was a, a, a very tough go, but very important book called On Human Conduct. But in the middle of those two major books, he wrote essays. And he wrote a lot of essays, and often, as I, I'll start out my talk by, by telling you this, he didn't publish everything he wrote. And this is pretty unusual for modern academics. Most of us feel like, well, everything you write has to be published. Oakshot wrote a lot, and he just stuck them in his desk drawer and never published them. So much of his work was discovered after he died and published after he died, including his journals. So watch out. If you keep a journal and become famous at some point, it's very likely people might try to publisher journals, which they've done for Oakshot, and they're very, they're very interesting. But let me just begin by trying to give some context to Oakshot and, and talk a little bit about um, who he was and what his unusual understanding of political philosophy looks like. After his death in 1990, Oakshot's executors found dozens of unpublished but completed essays in his desk. It's hard to imagine a, a modern day academic under pressure to produce, leaving such a volume of work unpublished. But Oakshot never felt compelled to bow to worldly pressures <laughs> or to pursue word, worldly gains, going so far as to decline graciously an offer of a knighthood. He confounded even friendly critics like Gertrude Himmelfarb, who commented that his early brilliance, quote, this is what she said, might have been expected to issue in an illustrious and productive career. Instead, he took his time producing about one average, one essay a year on average. Oakshot was entirely uninterested in being a public intellectual. Although he was a political philosopher of the first rank, he thought that most people had greatly exaggerated the importance of politics. That's an interesting side of Oakshot, a political philosopher who thinks that in the great scheme of things, politics is not the most important thing we could engage in. Though he had and continues to have many disciples, he did not ask for them. Unlike Leo Strauss, Alan Bloom, and many others of his stature, he cultivated no elite um, coterie of followers. In all this, Oakshot typified his own understanding of, of what a conservative was. He eschewed the usual conservative foundations of religion, natural law, private property, family relations, or free markets. And he is famous for having admonished uh, Friedrich Hayek for his plan to resist all planning, and Russell Kirk for his confusion <laughs> in setting out the speculative beliefs that Kirk thought must form the foundation of conservatism. So he didn't 
always make uh, friends super easily in this way. Conservatism, as Oakeshott described it in his famous 1956 essay, which you have read on being conservative, is not an ideology or a creed, but a disposition, a way of orienting oneself in and to the world. We'll talk more about what that means. This disposition entails, above all, an inclination to enjoy what there is to be enjoyed rather than to seek for what is not there. Is this notion of conservatism relevant in a time of moral and social crisis? This is the question that modern day conservative, conservatives ask. Writing in The American Scholar in 1975, Gertrude Hilmefar began wondered what basis there could be after the social revolution that she saw had taken place over the past decade for an authentic dispositional conservatism of enjoyment that emerged from a stable tradition of conduct. You could ask the same question today when the world Oakeshott assumed has passed even further away. The logic of, this is Himmelfarb, the logic of Oakeshott's position might suggest that the conservatives should acquiesce in the new modes of mind and conduct she observed. But what if these modes are essentially anarchical? If they so illegitimize social authority that they constitute, in effect, a permanent revolution? What happens, in short, when the adversary culture, to use Lionel Trilling's apt phrase, has become the dominant culture? In, in, our, in my own words, what we might ask is there to enjoy in Oakeshott's sense, and how do we recognize it? Oakeshott would have replied that we can only continue doing what we know to be worthwhile, drawing on and rejuvenating what remains of our tradition of thought and conduct. By the way, he's English. He didn't get that from the essays. He's not American, he's, he's English. <laughs> he's very English. Oakeshott would have also maintained that being conservative is not primarily a political, disp uh, a political disposition, and that in focusing excessively on politics, we necessarily neglect the very forms of life we aim to protect. In an early essay, Oakeshott said, political activity, and this is a quote from him, is a highly specialized and abstracted form of communal activity. It is conducted on the surface of the life of a society and except on rare occasions make, makes a remarkably small impression below that surface. Political activity, he said, encourages a limitation of view, which appears so clear and practical, but which amounts to little more than a mental fog. Oakeshott thought that society is sustained and rejuvenated, not by those who are engaged in politics, but by artists, poets, philosophers, and scholars, people whose distance from the world is not merely accidental, but essential to their work. More from Oakeshott. The emotional and intellectual integrity and insight for which they stand is something foreign to the political world. And so for Oakeshott, the conservative is not primarily defined by taking the right political positions, but by recognizing and preserving the beauty the world has to offer and by engaging as much as possible in activities that are worthwhile in themselves, especially for Oakeshott, friendship, love, aesthetic contemplation, conversation, and liberal learning, which I'll say a few things about at the end of this presentation. We did not have you read for this class the essay Rationalism in Politics, uh, which is, of course, the essay from which this takes its name. That's probably his most famous work. So if you're ever going to come across Oakeshott in the real world, if somebody's going to say, oh, have you read Rationalism in Politics? That's, that's one of the essays in here, and it's well worth your time. Uh, but he has this notion of rationalism, which I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, by way of explaining what he's against. The beauty the world has to offer is what rationalism loses. And the rationalist is the type of modern man whose character Oakeshott sketched in his most famous essay, Rationalism and Politics, first published in 1947 and, repub and republished 50 years ago in his essay collection of the same name and it's the one in this book. The rationalist is both skeptical and optimistic. Skeptical that there is anything he cannot master and optimistic about the possibilities for human progress. The, rationaliz the rationalist often appears as the earnest reformer, someone who perceives the world as a never ending series of problems and crises to be solved by the application of his reason and native ability. Oakeshott's rationalist is constitutionally incapable of contentment with any present state of affairs because everything always falls short of his ideal and therefore is constantly in need of improvement. Ra the rationalist is the enemy of authority, of prejudice, of the merely traditional, customary, or habitual. Compromise of any sort is a violation of his principles. One must always maintain ideological purity. 
The rationalist seeks to pursue perfection as the crow flies. His is the politics of faith, not traditional religious faith, but faith in the capacity of human beings to perfect themselves through their own efforts, made possible by the discovery of ways continually to increase the power of government as the essential instrumentality to control, design, and perfect individuals and groups. From a conservative perspective, we might assume that rationalist is only another term for liberal or progressive, but Oshot wouldn't say that. Rationalism is a disposition of mind that could infect those, can infect, and actually does infect those on the right as much as those on the left. In putting such faith in political creeds, mission statements, and manifestos, in what Oshot called the ideological style of politics, he thought that modern, modern conservatives had become nearly as rationalistic as modern progressives. Believing that reality is something we can fully understand and control, rationalists have failed to see that the source and strength of any particular platform of ideas doesn't lie in abstract thought, but in the lived experience out of which those ideas emerge. Creeds and mission statements are, Oakshot insisted, only abridgments. Rationalism, though, is not hostile to a life of the mind. It rather misunderstands or only partially understands the knowledge required for engaging in any valuable activity. The only knowledge the rationalist will admit is certain is what he calls, what Oakshot calls technical knowledge. That is knowledge that can be formulated into rules, principles, directions, maxims, and propositions. It is the grammar of a language, the handbook that comes with a new appliance, the technique book that accompanies a piano method. When we write about an art or a skill, we often write only about its technique because this has an appearance of certainty. Everything else, the aesthetic element, the artistry, the style, is observable only in the practice of it and may therefore seem less real. We take a break here and just ask you all if any of you are musicians. So you're going to play an instrument. What Oakshot is saying is that you cannot learn how to play an instrument by reading a book and putting the book into practice. <laughs> Does that seem true to you? <laughs> it, it should be true to you. It's very, very hard. And you can learn certain things from a book, a book and put them into practice, but you are not going to become a musician simply by reading a book and trying to put it into practice, the, <laughs> the, the elements of it. It's the same way in writing. Um, I had a student talk to me the other day and she said, you know, I can write a perfect sentence. I can write beautifully. But when my teacher comes up to me and asks me about grammar, I can't. I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what a direct object is. I don't really understand sentence structure. And Oakshot would say, well, you can write beautifully and you can play an instrument beautifully without having to know the things that lie behind the activity. So, which I think is a very, um, is very true. Anyone who has apprenticed himself or herself to a practitioner of a great art or science knows that technical knowledge is necessary, but not sufficient as a condition for a laudable performance. Actually, Oakshot might say it's not even necessary, but it's certainly not sufficient. Oakshot saw that not to detect a person's style is to have missed three quarters of the meaning of his actions and utterances. And not to have acquired a style is to have shut oneself off from the ability con to convey any but the crudest meanings. This inexpressible, stylistic, even aesthetic component is the crucial element in any performance. Such practical knowledge is thus the essential counterpart of technical knowledge. So I used the music example. You can imagine it for sports too. How many of you all are athletes? You don't have to raise your hand, but I suspect many of you are. <laughs> is there something like a style that certain athletes have? You can recognize it when you see it, the way somebody handles a tennis racket or a soccer ball. This is what Oksha's talking about. It's this inexpressible, uh, practical knowledge that you have only, by, uh, only from doing the thing. So back to politics. Rationalism in politics often had dire consequences because the rationalist tends to have inordinate faith in policy solutions, slogans, and political machinery to guide citizens toward a good the rationalist has chosen while neglecting to think about how people actually live and think, what they actually do and need. The rationalist pursues the politics of perfection when perfection is unattainable. One cannot govern simply by following a user's manual. Even if we can separate, as Oakshot put it, the ore of the ideal from the dross of the habit of behavior, the ideals cannot be lived outside the cultural, religious, and moral life in which they developed. In a striking passage in Rationalism in Politics, Oakshot wrote that moral ideals are a kind of sediment 
and have significance only so long as they are suspended in a religious or social tradition, only so long as they belong to a religious or a social life. When this religious and social tradition withers, we are left with nothing but the dry and gritty residue which chokes us as we try to take it down. <laughs> Thus, says Oakshot, we have the spectacle of a set of sanctimonious rationalist politicians preaching an ideology of unselfishness and social service to a population in which they and their predecessors have done the, their best to destroy the only living root of moral behavior. The conservative, on the other hand, for Oakshot, is the photographic negative of the rationalist. While rational, and this this will this ought to remind you, those of you who've read the Tower of Babel, of the two modes of. Um, while rationalism accepts only the certainty of principles, maxims, and rules, Oakeshott's conservatism needs no foundational principles to anchor it. A conservative attitude requires that one be equal to one's own fortune, to live at the level of one's own means, and to be content with the want of greater perfection, which belongs alike to oneself and one's circumstances. Oakeshott's conservative is aware of what he has and finds it valuable despite its unavoidable imperfection. Its value derives from its familiarity. A conservative neither longs for a utopian future nor has an excessive reverence for a past and golden age. And this is where Oakeshott departs from some other conservatives. The conservative accept the dis accepts the disturbed vision of weakness and wickedness of mankind and the transitoriness of human achievement and rejects the allure of the gilded future foreseen in the vision of faith. Instead, what is esteemed is the present and happiness consists in cultivating and delighting in what one has been given. Uh, you didn't read some of Oshat's early essays, but in his early essays, and especially as a young man, he emphasizes that the essence of conservatism is to live in the present. It sounds like a hokey thing to say, but, but what he's saying is the conservative doesn't live sort of with reference to this glorious past, but nor does he live with the reference to a utopian future that the person is equal to the situation in which we find ourselves. So this disposition can be detected throughout Oakeshott's corpus in his notion of the poetic character of human experience, his love of conversation, he was apparently a great conversationalist, and his fondness for all activities that could be pursued as ends in themselves, like friendship, liberal learning, poetry, and fishing is one of the names. The conservative writer Walter Badgett expressed a similar idea when he wrote in 1854 the following lines. Talk of the ways of spreading a wholesome conservatism throughout this country, give painful lectures, distribute weary tracts. But as far as communicating and establishing your creed are concerned, instead, try a little pleasure. The way to keep old customs up is to enjoy old customs. The way to be satisfied with the present state of things is to enjoy that state of things. To enjoy old customs is emphatically not a political response, though it is thoroughly conservative. So what does the cultivation of this conservative disposition mean for Oakeshott and for politics in particular? Above all, it means that politics can never be a true source of human fulfillment. Following both Augustine and Hobbes, Oakeshott saw that there was no hope of transforming the human condition and thus insuperable ob obstacles stand in the way of many progressive aims. The best political activity can do is to enforce a rule of law that allows people to leave, live peaceably with one another as they pursue the activities in which they have chosen to seek their happiness. Thus political conservatism must be predicated on this dispositional conservatism. It assumes that we know what to do with our freedom, that we have the ability to see the limits of politics and of all work, worldly aspiration, and that we could enjoy the enormous riches of the created world and about our own intellectual tradition. It is the disposition at once skeptical and joyful. Some people are, gonna, are going to complain that this is too romantic, too English. It's a disposition that can't be sustained over the course of a life and certainly not at times of crisis or moral decay. And this is in a way Himmel, Himmelfarb's question come back to haunt us. Where, once the adversary culture has become the dominant culture, once the old habits are no longer habits, can one look for guidance? An example of the dominance of this adversary culture may help us both to imagine and formulate an Oakshadian response to Himmelfarb's question. 
This is the crisis in contemporary liberal education. The crisis, you may have talked about this in your class, I don't know. Crisis is usually uh, explained as this. Fewer students every year seek a liberal arts degree uh, and those that do confront a politicized and corrupted view of the liberal arts. Liberal arts. Any tradition that college students encounter nowadays very often tends toward either the vacuous or the politicized. The, acad <laughs> the academy has been largely overtaken by revolutionaries. In responding to these developments, which had begun in Oakshot's time, and he was writing many of these essays in the 1950s, he would have begun by observing the crucial distinction between engaging in an activity itself and fighting in defense of that activity. In working to sustain the tradition of the great books, for instance, we may find that we are so busy protecting the idea that we ourselves have no time for reading. As C.S. Lewis wrote in Learning in Wartime, the person who surrenders himself to any cause, conservative or not, is rendering to Caesar that which of all things most emphatically belongs to God himself. So in other words, all he's saying is, look, if we, if we go out and understand ourselves as fighters in the service of any cause, it's very likely that what's going to become primary for us is the fight and not the cause we were, starting, we were trying to defend. I'll give you another music example. You can imagine a cellist who goes out and says, well, nobody's going to classical music concerts anymore. I want to preserve the tradition of classical music. So this person goes out and starts a think tank that whose aim is to preserve classical music. And he goes around and lectures and does all sorts of um, publicity events. But in the meantime, has given up the very activity of playing the cello because he's gone out and fought to preserve the activity. So Okshana says you, you can't mistake the fighting for doing the activity itself. Oakshot consistently focuses both, both on the essence of the activity, poetry, philosophy, liberal learning, for example, and on the character of the person who's engaging in it. He insisted, for instance, that those who wish to preserve the tradition of liberal learning actually teach and learn, serving as models for, teach, for students and initiating them into what he thought was a very rich intellectual inheritance. Of course, he did recognize that there were battles to be fought, but the primary aim of the people who were doing the fighting ought not to be the fighting, but the, the activity itself. This response probably would not have satisfied Gertrude Himmelfar, his critic, at least here, for she sought foundations that Oakeshott was unwilling and temperamentally unable to provide. She desired creedal or uh, religious underpinnings for fighting what she saw as the adversary culture. But for Oakeshott, conservatism was not a philosophical position per se, much less an ideological one but a disposition. It was not primarily battle, but enjoyment. And I think we'll want to take some time at some point to talk about what does he mean by disposition? Sort of disposition, it's a weird word. Still, I think Oakshot's fundamental insight about rationalism is of great importance for all of us who wish to cultivate or resuscitate, as the case may be, an intellectual or moral tradition. His insight is that there are no shortcuts to success in politics or anything else. And that the rationalist approach to life is as fundamentally flawed as it is widespread in the modern world. He describes the rationalist this way. The rationalist has a deep distrust of time, an impatient hunger for eternity, and an irritable nervousness in the face of everything topical and transitory. His attitude represents a kind of Gnosticism, as Oakeshott explicitly observed, and he traced the rise of rationalism to a concurrent falling away from religious faith even though Oakeshott was not a traditionally religious person himself. Rationalism Oakeshott maintained is closely allied with the decline in the belief in providence. A beneficent and infallible technique replaced a beneficent and infallible God. And while where providence was not available to correct the mistakes of men, it was all the more necessary to prevent such mistakes. This rationalism is no doubt a permanent tendency in human nature. In several places, Oakeshott described it as Pelagian, and so far as it assumes the possibility of worldly perfection achieve, achievable through human action. He saw clearly that human beings are continually inclined to be prideful, and at the same time, to use a patently modern word, insecure. To assuage our anxiety, we undertake massive political projects to remake the world, hoping that we might hide from or ignore the fact that each of us must die. We place our hope not in God, but in human effort and in an improvement we, and in, and in an improvement we will obtain in an amorphous and constantly receding future. Oakshot thought the left believed in collectivist programs, the right in the unrestrained market, but both responses he saw as rationalistic. 
faithless to present arrangements, intolerant of settled arrangements, and a culture that supports them, overestimating human potential, and fundamentally misunderstanding the capacity of politics to make significant changes in human life. Oakshot's insight into this conservative disposition is actually quite simple. It is that in responding to the excesses of contemporary liberalism and progressivism, as well as to conservative rationalism, we ought not to compete on rationalist terms as if another mission statement or manifesto or policy could save us. The work of conservatives, Oakshot thought, is above all to identify, preserve and enjoy, and thereby to rejuvenate the good traditions and institutions that remain especially those activities that may appear pointless and wasteful from the perspective of those who want only to maximize utility. Let me say just a little bit more about his view of liberal education, because this is a part of Oakshot. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's more or less rationalism. I, I think in a few minutes, we'll talk about the, the essay, The Tower of Babel and the conservative, conservative disposition. Uh, but, but Oakshot has a wonderful uh, collection of essays. So if you, any of you liked him, Go and check out his book called the, uh, the Voice of Liberal Learning, which is was not it was published at the very end of his life. It's where he uh, he was a university teacher at the London School of Economics for many years, and he reflected on the notion of what is what is liberal education? Are we doing it? Are we failing to do it? To, to or have, have we given it up altogether? And he was talking again in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. The, the book was published in the 1990s, but it's I think it remains relevant today. Let me just say a few words about that, and then we'll um, we'll turn in a little bit to questions. Those of us who are involved in liberal education, as I think you all are by being in this class, are often put on the defensive by adversaries. These adversaries want to professionalize or politicize universities, <laughs> and sometimes they reject or refuse to understand knowledge as an end in itself, to borrow John Henry Newman's famous formulation. Even certain allies of liberal education, Lecturers prone to giving well-intentioned but tedious exhortations about the good of the humanities sometimes do more harm than good in their attempts to inspire young people to pursue a life or at least an interval of learning. Contemporary writing about liberal education thus often tends toward the defensive, the preachy, and the simply boring. But Oakshot's vision of liberal education, in contrast, offers the prospect of intellectual and moral adventure. His essays are full of varied and enticing invitations to self-understanding. He suggests that individuals might achieve an elegant fluency in thought and speech that comes through learning the languages or the modes of history, science, practical life, and aesthetics. His essays on education do not exactly concern the canon or the various styles of pedagogy, although he has definite thoughts about teaching and learning. Liberal education is instead for Oakshot an ongoing activity of self-enactment and self-realization, these are terms he uses. It requires that each person develop something like a philosophy of life in which we understand ourselves both as inheritors of a tradition and as artists in our own right. In the words of a British writer, early 20th century British writer who Oakshot liked, John Cowper Poes, the desirable, I love this, this quote, and just listen to it. The desirable effect upon one's mind of imaginative literature is not to strengthen one's, to strengthen one's memory or enlarge one's learning, or to inspire one to gather a, a collection of passages from the great authors. Rather, such literature encourages us to become great authors ourselves, not in the sense that we must all be writers, but so that we might think, act, play, philosophize, and live in ways that are simultaneously creative and informed by a rich intellectual tradition. But Oakeshott's attitude toward education was not always positive and appreciative. He was sometimes an incisive and harsh critic of mid 20th century education. In two essays, The Universities and Education and Engagement, its frustration, he would have deplored many of the revolutions that, he, that we are ex experiencing now. An accurate assessment of his thought about education must, must therefore convey his twofold purpose. On the one hand, he's diagnosing the ills of contemporary universities in his time, and I think also in ours, hmm. and he's offering a vision of something better. His criticisms of the university focus on several things. The first is the modern tendency to view schooling as socialization, in which he saw students being conceived as functionaries and role players. Universities, he laments, lo no longer adequately foster self-discovery, but instead cast young people as apprentices to adult life. 
activity in these schools is governed by an extrinsic purpose, like producing enough electrical engineers, nuclear scientists, and social workers to staff the needs of a given society. Tracing the origins of this movement to Francis Bacon, he observes that although the reasons for the shift to practical education were reasonable enough, successive ways of industrialization did require technical education. This endeavor has grown far beyond its original bounds. He says, such a makeshift for education. You know, so basically, most of the reasons that most of us are in college, he's criticizing. Such a makeshift for education was permitted to corrupt the educational engagement of European peoples and it is now proclaimed as its desirable successor. This new understanding has ushered in what he called a dark age devoted to barbaric fluence. But the substitution of socialization into career is not the only problem Upshot identifies and perhaps not even the most serious. Even more widespread in our time than in Oakshot's is a conscious rejection of the past. Many people, as Upshot said, so far from embracing and venerating an intellectual inher inheritance, view their studies of past events as opportunities for e exercising their well-developed faculties of critical thinking. They criticize, problematize, deconstruct, and tear down. The obligation of each new generation on this telling is ceremonially to, ceremonially to reject what it is corrupting or even to inspect, and instead to originate its own understandings. Another element of Oakshot's critical view is a profound skepticism about the motives and actions of university reformers. His famous conservatism comes to the fore in the defense of existing universities against such would be reformers. And in general, he considers reform as something to be resisted, not welcomed. Hmm. As he famously observed elsewhere, every change is an emblem of extinction. Hmm. That was in rationalism. I think that was in a being conservative. In the universities, which is an essay, an essay he wrote in 1950, he launches a withering critique of, a, of this poor guy, Sir Walter Moberly. He says, Moberly has asserted that universities are in an, un, in an unprecedented crisis, partly due to the Second World War, but also because they do not seem to be in tune with the times with respect to science and technology, <laughs> nor are the universities clear about their purposes. The question of what is a university for has not been sufficiently answered. Now is the time for revolutionary reform, or so he thinks. But Oakshot archly observes, because the world is upside down, Moberly thinks that now is the most profitable moment to take to turn the universities inside out. But Oakshot will have none of this. According to him, universities were never devised by a set of intelligent innovators. They're not the result of any process or technique of intentional creation, and they can give no thoroughly rational account of themselves. The universities in 1950, and perhaps even today, are perhaps best understood as examples of a practice with its origins deep in the past. Those who live and work in universities pursuing liberal learning, both teachers and students, still have intimations that they are doing something important, <laughs> even if they cannot give an elevator speech exactly what that is. <laughs> and we do not aim at career or activism, at least what part of what we are doing in universities has to do with helping young people achieve a satisfying sense of personal identity. This requires both clearing away and building up. The clearing away consists in rejecting certain common modes of self-understanding. During Oakshot's lifetime, as in our own time, young people were increasingly subject to what he called a ceaseless flow of seductive trivialities. Ever-expanding and prolific technology impedes the leisure required for serious thought. How much easier it is to watch television or talk on the phone in his time or for us to be on our phones than it is to read and think. Or Oakshot would have said how much e easier it is to adopt a ready-made identity based in grievance. Modern social science, as Oakshot observes in On Human Conduct, encourages a view of human beings as mere data points or discrete phenomena subject to the same sort of impersonal laws as those that govern all other animal life. But this distinctive feature of being human, as Oakshot saw it, was that we have reasons and not causes for our actions and the self-understandings we develop are chosen, not given. So he, he's critical and he's positive. There's a lot to be cleared away, but he said the building up of the identity of those who are in universities is not to be accomplished in a vacuum by means of new age philosophies or through the use of drugs or other modes of escape. 
He writes, each of us is self-made, but not out of nothing and not by the light of me. The world is full of homemade human beings, but they are rickety constructions of impulses, ready to fall apart in what is called an identity crisis. <laughs> Instead of these rickety constructions, liberal education for Upshot offers the prospect of achieving a more durable and consistent identity by imagining the many different kinds of lives available to human beings. Such learning is not mired in the, mo in the moment. The ancient Greek exhortation, know thyself, meant learn to know thyself. It meant contemplate and learn from what men from time to time have made of this engagement of learning to be a man. In an evocative passage, Oakshot writes about the almost sacred quality that a university may embody. School is a place apart, which offers a young person an interval and a middle moment. In this break from the incessant noise of politics and career, some lucky students may move from the particular to the universal guided by a teacher or teachers. He wrote this, each of us is born in a corner of the earth and at a particular moment in historic time, lapped round with locality. But school and university are places apart where a declared learner is emancipated from the limitations of his local circumstances and from the wants he may happen to have acquired and is moved by intimations of what he's never dreamed. In places like this, the den of local partialities is no more than a distant rumble, and the learner may be initiated into a great tradition of culture, which before may have been entirely obscure. So Oakshot's essays about education as a whole are a continual protest against determinism and behaviorism. They're a celebration of intelligent individualism that is achieved fully only in the adventure of learning. And for Oakshot, liberal education was always an adventure never a duty or a burden. And I wanna end by reading you a quote uh, from somebody he uses and quotes in his essays. This, this man is named William Corey. He was a schoolmaster at Eton in England. And he has this wonderful vision of what a liberal education would be. And Oakshot, all of Oakshot's work is a kind of gloss on this. This person wrote, you go to a great school, not so much for knowledge as for arts and habits for the habit of attention, for the art of expression, for the art of assuming at a moment's notice a new intellectual position, for the art of entering quickly into another person's thoughts, for the habit of submitting to censure and ref refutation, for the art of indicating assent or dissent in graduated terms. And above all, you go to a great school for self-knowledge. So that's a very quick overview of what I think are some of the key parts of Oshot's thought. The one is conservatism. The, the second is liberal learning. And, I, and for him, these are, these are both, uh, they're, they're quite linked. But to, to know what there is to appreciate as a, as a conservative, you need to know what the world has to offer. And it, not, it may not be what Madison has to offer on this particular day in March. <laughs> All right, so I'm open to questions. I would love to hear your thoughts about um, what I've said or anything else. <clears throat> yeah, I was going to say it was interesting your comment about uh, being able to write creatively or use a language without knowing about grammar and parts of speech. And I think that's extremely true. And I was always in the dark about understanding things about grammar, parts of speech, and their use until I started studying other languages. Mm -hmm. And then it became almost essential to know these things in order oh, yeah. to be able to use a second language. and how to construct uh, sentences and patterns of thought properly. So mm -hmm. yeah, I thought that was worth remarking on. I was curious, did Oakshot, was he involved at all in British politics or parties or was he entirely up on the academic plane? I think he was really on the academic plane. Uh -huh. um, he, for the reasons I've mentioned, he didn't love to be involved in, in party politics. He actually thought, that one of the essays I, I quote from is, is this little essay called The Claim to Politics, where he basically says, everybody overestimates the importance of politics. Society is rejuvenated and reconstructed by the people who are living in the society and doing the creative things and the teachers and the entrepreneurs, but it's not the politicians. They're meant to guard, the, they're, they're sort of meant to keep up the rule of law. I mean, this is not a, this is not an understanding of politics that we, we follow in the United States, but it was, it was his, his idea. 
And so therefore, um, the, the things that were of true importance were not political. And so he didn't engage in them. He wanted to understand politics rather than understand. But he did live through crises. Oh, yeah. I mean, he lived from 1901 to 1990. So two world wars. He was actually in the military intelligence in the Second World War. He loved that. He was very good at it. So it wasn't that he was you know, too good for the world. But when he you know, did what he thought he was you know, fit to do, it was to teach and to learn and to write. Mm -hmm. Yes. So at first, I was interested in thoughts on that. So Oakshot places style above the rules in like various arts. He does, yes. And then, so a few weeks I have to submit a paper for this class. So would Oakshot yes. want me to write a paper <laughs> in my style or even experiment <laughs> with the style for an academic paper or <laughs> something else? Oh, I feel like this is a triangular question. <laughs> uh, okay, what would Oakshot want you to do? <laughs> Well, when I say, and when Oakshot says that style is more important than, uh, that style is more important than following rules, it doesn't mean that the rules are, or that the, the tradition of the thing that you're doing is irrelevant. So I suppose he would probably say, you need to know what a good paper is, and you need to know how to write coherently and well. Once you Once you've mastered that, then you are free to experiment with with writing in whatever way you wish. Um, you know, it, it is like it is like language. I mean, we all we all have some facility with language, certainly with the English language. You are free to say anything you want in the English language, but but you didn't you didn't get there by being dropped out of, the, out of space. You you've come up in a tradition of of learning how to talk and learning what's appropriate to say and what's not appropriate to say at certain times. So I would encourage you to use your prudential judgment. Um, as you write your paper. Did Oak Shaw ever write an aphorism? So that's the question. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to write an aphorism? Oh, I would love to. <laughs> Oak Shaw didn't write an aphorism, but his journals are very aphoristic and they're, they're wonderful. Thing. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was interested in his comments about the need for the conservative to live within the reality of the times he's living in. And I think that sort of contrasts with the Marxist who's quite willing to live for a revolution that he may never see in his life or may never occur for hundreds or thousands of years. Yeah. I, I just found that contrast remarkable because leftists are always trying to see the next crisis and capitalism and all this as the preconditions for that revolution that they're waiting for that, you know, may never come. I, I just find the contrast very noteworthy. Well, it is. And this is this is what I was trying to say to you all. I mean, it, he's he's not one of these conservatives who who he's well, he's certainly not progressive and he's not a Marxist and he's right. not looking at the future. But he's also not reverencing the past. I mean, he's not Burke. Have you read Burke in here? Okay, so you kind of have a sense of who Burke was. He's really, he's not Burke. People say he's the, he was the modern Burke, but he, he really wasn't. He was, a, he actually invested in living the life you, you have and living it now, using the, the goods that come down to you through the tradition, but being fully invested in, in the present. Did you have a question? Well, I would defer to students, certainly. But... Yes. What would you say about like graduate schools or like higher beyond? college or university, are those like protected by political ideologies or? You already mean protected. Or not protected, but like, just aren't they sheltered as well from like? Well, I think it depends on, I think it depends on what you study. I mean, I, I think Oakshot, I mean, Oakshot himself was interested in liberal learning in a very sort of pure way of the kind I described, which is asking questions about history and philosophy and science and aesthetics and all the things that, that constitute kind of the human inheritance that we have. He, he thought that undergraduate schools were doing students a disservice when they got rid of all that stuff and said, you're gonna become a, you know, an electrical engineer and so you're only gonna take electrical engineering classes. I don't think he ever really much thought about graduate schools um, just because for one thing, he never, he never taught in them. He might've said, well, that's something different. You know, there's a place for law school and there's a place for medical school where you are there to specialize and you're doing something that is deeply practical and you've made that choice to do that. But that's different from 
what he thought you were doing in the, at the undergraduate level, which was to, to remain open and to not feel like you had to specialize. I mean, I might ask you all, does this make any sense in the modern world? Or is he just talking about something that, that can't happen any longer? Remember, he talks about the university at an interval where you kind of, I, I don't want to say take a break, but you're not here supposedly on Oakshot's terms to become politicized and you're not here to become a, for your career. You're here to explore and to think and to write and to imagine things that you've never known about because you've never taken the time to learn about them. Is that, does that fit with your experience in college or is that just weird? No, I think it's it still of, holds true. I'm really interested to know what the students think because you know, you're in this interval. Um, there, there definitely is a lot of people. There's a big movement of I'm here to get a degree. I'm here to get a good job so I can make money. And you see that all over, um, especially in the hard sciences, especially in engineering. I have that experience less. I'm, I'm in the I'm a philosophy major, mm -hmm. an economics major. A lot of people there are doing philosophy so they can get the, the highest paying job. <laughs> they're, they're there to do, I think, what, what Oakshot is suggesting. This, yes. this idea where you want to sit around and think and become better, at, like habituating yourself towards thinking and speaking more efficiently and, and better. And, and so I I think there's I think there's some of each and we're losing this the thing that Oakshot is is suggesting, but but it's not it's not gone completely. And I might also ask you all, do you think what do you think is more the reason for this? Is it career or is it politics? Because there, there's an, also an understanding of college that says, look, you, you go to college to kind of throw off all your naive understandings of, of politics and religion. You come to college and then you you learn what the truth is. Yeah. Does that does that resonate with your experience or is it just really all about career? Yeah. It's more related to career just to the fact that in the system that we live in, it is so hard to get anywhere comfortably while just going to like primary education or like graduating, graduating out of high school. Like you need a professional career to be able to do anything or have any future that you want to do. So maybe somebody here would say, retort to Oakshot, well, that's wonderful for you living back in the you know 20s and 30s and 40s. And you had this freedom that we don't have because the career question is is much more pressing for us. Yeah. Um, I also think it is, again, like how you choose to do college. So like I always knew I was planning on going to law school after college. So I, cho I chose to take like classes that I wouldn't ordinarily take. So I did take classes on religion and like, different countries and like politics and things like that but I also know a lot of my friends who are like in the business school for example are purely taking like finance and like accounting and things like that so I think it really depends yes I should point out that this class is a meets with class so roughly half the class are in political science 460 and the other half of the class are in integrated liberal studies 372 political science of course at the University of Wisconsin is big 10 is heavily driven by quantitative methods and most of my colleagues, not all of my colleagues, many of my colleagues regard uh, the learning of political science as sort of a, a technical accomplishment um, with very, you know, they're very precise about it. You know, our two integrated level studies, our motto is learning independently together, whatever that might be. Uh, it's a nice, a nice thing, but it actually it, it speaks to, you know, integrated liberal studies is a corner on our campus where we do this kind of thing, yeah. right? Exploring the great text with regard to science, the great text for economics and politics and literature and art as well. And that sort of serves, serves as the core um, of, of the program. And then our upper level classes can go more into depth in these, in these fields. Um, and what I, when I'm chair of integrated liberal studies, students say, I want to take more of this, like, perfect. It's a certificate. It's a minor, which is, Maybe you could do more, but I, th I think, you know, get a degree in economics, business, and a certificate in integrated liberal studies and sort of bring the, the two together so that you don't have to say, look, I don't care about career. I want a philosophy. I want a philosophy degree. But hey, I've also got an econ so I can crunch some numbers and make a ton of money too. So, I mean, there's our, there's our integrated liberal studies slash social scientist example there. So I think we're doing a pretty good job here at University of Wisconsin trying to find that middle, the middle ground 
here. I don't know if that's Oakshadian. Um, no, I don't but, think it is, <laughs> really. I mean, I, I think he would see the wisdom of what you're saying, especially in our circumstances. But I think he would say, you know what's going to happen when you try to do both is that all the practical stuff is going to crowd out the other stuff. And it does tend to because you have multiple motivations for wanting to do the practical things. You know, you, you do want a job. You don't want to be homeless and, you know, have no income. You, you, your parents certainly don't want that. <laughs> no. uh, so there's there are all these practical reasons that you want to study those things. And it might just be that you say, well, I'm starting to see less and less the point of why I ought to be doing art history and philosophy. I'll just go, I'll, I'll just go all in. So, I mean, if you can keep the balance, I suspect he would be open to that. But, but I think he thinks the practical, let me just explain when I, I talk about the practical life a lot with Oakshot, he had the idea that you could see the world through modes. And this was his first book that I said was kind of hard and obscure. <clears throat> it's called experience and it's modes. He said, look, there are lots of ways you can see the world and the preeminent among them are history. Well, let me do it this way. What is this? Spring water. Trash. <laughs> spring water. Okay. Um, okay, it's spring water in, in it. But what's the, what's the thing that's holding it? It's, yeah, it's, a, it's a water carton. Okay. Um, what's it for? Well, to hold water and to make me less thirsty. I might ask you that and ask for another kind of answer. So if I held this up and you said, okay, well, it's a, it's a carton holding water. Can you think of another mode of an that you, in which you could answer that question? <clears throat> right, yes. I don't know, I mean, you think on like an environmental perspective that it's made out of cardboard instead of water bottle, like plastic, like a normal water. Very interesting. Okay, so you're almost, well, you're, you're calling it environmental, but in a way, you, what you're trying to do is to describe this by what's made out of, which is kind of sciencey. Now, I don't know what cardboard is made out of. I've had a plastic water bottle. What is it? Polymers and natural gas. And I mean, some of you are have got to be in chemistry and you could say it better. But you can say this is this is a um, an assortment of, of it's a molecular structure that combines. And we could examine it if we wanted to. We could figure out actually what this is made out of. That would be a scientific answer. Okay, so that's another. I mean, those are two modes already. One is the practical. One is the scientific. Oakshaw says there are other modes too. How else might you answer this? Yeah. You can look at it as a product. Yeah, that's kind of practical though. I mean, it's, it's a something... very bad sculpture. What do you say? It's a very bad sculpture. <laughs> Actually, that's that is a mode. You could say it's aesthetic. Well, it's temporary nature. It has a temporary utilitarian well, value. True, but that's 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 back in the practical mode. But you could, I mean, let's say this were beautiful. Let's say we had a really pretty water bottle. We'd say, I love the way this has this beautiful um, you know, design on the side, and the lettering is gorgeous, and I can contemplate it and enjoy it as an end in itself. That would be to look at it aesthetically. Another one, very common. It's a weapon. <laughs> That's a practical answer, though. I mean, because yes, it could be a. I mean, kind of a sad weapon, but it could be a weapon. Yeah. You could look at it as like the end result of like, relationships, starting with whoever like owned the tree that like went into it, and then the factory, and then like the driver and the. That's a good answer, actually. That's not one of his modes, but that's something like an economic understanding. You know, or, or it could be an economic understanding. What What is it that brought this about as an object for us to kind of play here? Well, it was a set of economic forces that inspired people to make this. You could also look at it historically. You say this is the modern version of the Bedouin goat bladder, the Thracian <laughs> drinking horn. And you could look all the way back at drinking vessels and, and, and see this as the modern instantiation of the drinking vessel. So what, what Oakshot is, the, the reason I bring this up is that Oakshot has this idea that liberal learning gives you the ability to look at things in a variety of ways. And, and much more important things than, than water cartons or water bottles. But you could look at you could look at love and friendship as a practical thing. You know, we have our friends so that we um, have something to do on Saturday night. We use them um, we, we to get their reflected glory. Or we could look at friendship as a kind of end in itself. 
love of the other person. That is almost to look at it aesthetically. And so he has this idea that we're opened up to a whole world of experience that's there all the time, but that we never do because we're always looking at things practically. And I think that's his objection to doing the practical stuff in college because you don't, you're not pushed to think about there are other ways of viewing the world besides just my wants and desires and maximizing my utility. Not that that's all we do in the practical mode, but it is one of the things we do. Yeah. So is Oakshark completely then STEM like type, like engineering practical type stuff, or is it just more ease against how universities prioritize that over? He's a, yes, that. I mean, um, he would be, he'd be shocked at how much contemporary American universities, I think much more than English, prioritize STEM, engineering, pre-professional, uh, pre-professional work. Yes. Yes. I know that Oakshot said he was a conservative. I just don't see any reason to believe it. <laughs> um, when I think about everything you said, but but also the you know the post-war intellectuals that he was most like live in the present. I think of Camus. Um, you know, you're a part of a tradition, and you can only understand things in that tradition. I think of Gadamer. I um, you know. No, no belief in fixed nature, no belief in religion, no belief in uh, rational ordering of political and social life. Um, <laughs> complaints about the over um, technical and, and professionalization of education. That, that was what they were complaining about in the 60s. Um, that was Mario Salvo's speech. You know, it was all about the university as a machine. Um, so what it, it, I, I understand it itself identified that way, and and maybe there was some corner of the English Conservative Party pre Thatcher where this was welcome, but never in this country, as far as I could tell. No. And and so what you know I, I some some people are just wrong about what they are. Um, you know why why if I add up all of his political positions and and the intellectual why why. Why, why do you really think he's conservative, I guess? Well, that's a, that's a really interesting question. And a lot of people, this is why Oakshot has always never, well, has always never, has never been a fit in American conservatives and why Himmelfarb thinks he's crazy and why lots of other people did too. Um, he, one person I know who studies Oakshot said, the reason that he doesn't fit is that he is first and foremost a philosopher and he doesn't care as much about party labels as oh, he doesn't care at all about party labels. He wants to he wants to examine experience as he understands it. And so it's not surprising that he would come out with Gadamer and Camus on certain things and you know a variety of other strange bedfellows. Um, I think we call I call him a you know and I, I actually personally identify very much with what he says about conservatism. But my friends will often ask me, well are you are you know are there are you therefore a Republican? I'm like, well I don't I don't know where I would fall. In, in this in this world of contemporary American politics. I, I am an Oakshadian in the sense that I, I, I agree with what he says on being conservative. But whether or not that maps onto anything in the, in the American world is, is, a, is a big question. And frankly, it's a question of how much of a conservative he was in England either. I don't, he was not, people say he was a Thatcher, but he didn't, didn't want to be knighted by Thatcher. He didn't want, to, he didn't want any of it. So in a way, I mean, what you say is right. He's, he's, he's not a party man. So to call him a conservative is to accept his own understanding of what conservatism is. And if we do that, then he is what he is. So how does he fit in this class? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I guess we'll talk about that in, in a bit, but I mean, it, do you have any sense that he would fit in this tradition you've been studying or that he's just an odd duck or what? Yeah, I remember who the authors were just two weeks ago. Um, but I feel like most of the people we've focused on so far are really concerned with following history and looking at sort of like past traditions. So he's very different from that, which I kind of enjoy. Yeah. His way of looking at things a little bit more than um, a lot of the other ones are kind of just like stuck on like <laughs> tradition. Well, I mean, Anokshad is not anti-traditional, but he, if people will call him, uh, he's not a foundationalist. 
he doesn't ground his philosophizing on a sense of natural law or on the Bible or on, um, you know, tradition as Bart would have talked about it. So in that way, yeah, I mean, he's, uh, he makes a lot of people uncomfortable because those foundations are not there. So yes, you're right. Yeah. One aspect of his, of his thought that, that seems to be consistent with, I think everybody else we've read is not projecting some utopian idea towards the future and striving to, to get there, but just saying like, uh, understanding that we that we can't reach this this utopia and that we should live in the present and, and not seek for this radical change that seems to be consistent throughout all of the, all of the people that we've read so far including yeah that's Russia. probably right i mean I, I love the way he talks about i mean it's it's not as if conservatives don't expect that there will be change or that they don't have to accommodate themselves to change they're just not as excited about it as uh, say a progressive would be because they're not that dissatisfied with things as they are. I mean, and that's a, that's a really interesting way of looking at the world. It's just a, you know, I, there's actually a lot to be lost that we take for granted unless we have eyes to see it. And in losing those good things, I, I would rather not lose those good things for this sort of imagined future. Uh, and so that part of that part of him, I think, is is conservative in a traditional way. That every change is an emblem of extinction. I mean, what what do you think that means? It's a provocative line. Yeah. I mean, I think we actually kind of talked about this in this in the like our little discussion group. Like, um, like we saw it. It's kind of you're losing. You're every single time you're changing something, you're losing. You're losing something. You're like change, you're taking a part away of how society works, and you're saying you're taking away and you said making it extinct. Yeah. How this society works. And I just, I mean, I think it's really interesting in a way to think about it, even if like, you know, just, I don't know, just, that's how we thought it. Yeah, you know, I don't know if any of you have, have younger siblings, but um, children are some of the most conservative people that you will meet. If you tell them that you're doing something one way and they're used to doing, or if you do things a certain way, and then all of a sudden, you know, let's say you imagine, well, we're gonna, we're gonna move house, no! You can't move houses. I love this house. I love this room. I love this bear. You know, they want to stay exactly where they are. They don't want to, they don't want to move. And I think there's a little bit of that in all of us. So like, well, once we've accustomed ourselves to a certain set of uh, to a certain routine and a certain way of doing things, it's painful to for change to come. That doesn't mean it's always bad, but it it's certainly not an always a natural thing. And it's not something to be sought. And so Upshot's just saying, look, let's. Let's be grateful for the things we do have and be very careful before we change them for an imagined future. Yeah, I have a question. How, how come the uh, shot fits in like the British intellectual tradition? Because he he doesn't probably doesn't like the utilitarians. Mm, not uh, really. Uh, John Locke too. But he doesn't care much, but he kind of likes Thomas Hobbes and David Hume. Hume I can understand, but Hobbes is a, is a weird fit in his intellectual interest, you know? What is his relationship to Thomas Hobbes? Well, Hume, so. he, he likes Hume for his skepticism, although Oakeshott's skepticism is less, I think, radical than, than Hume's. Let me just name some others that he loves. He loves Montaigne, he loves Pascal. Um, he, he is, he's constantly concerned with questions. Well, I mean, why does he like Hobbes? Well, he likes Hobbes, I think, I think because um, he's concerned with a kind of Augustinian, Hobbesian sense of let's do the minimum required for a peaceful society. And he, he wants to, let's say politics does this much and so much and no more, and then it leaves a space for people to, to pursue their own self-chosen interests. And, you know, he's, He's, he, you're right, though, he doesn't fit very well with Burke. Uh, he, you know, he, I'm trying to think who else he, he read. I mean, it is, is Hobbes, Montaigne, Pascal. Uh, I mean, he read, he read the whole tradition, but those were the people I think he had um, most in common with. But he picks and chooses bits from each of the philosophers. He's, he doesn't ever say, well, I'm a disciple of Hobbes. He has a, his own particular interpretation of Hobbes. 
that, that he pushes for, his own particular interpretation of the destiny. So he's very unwilling to be, uh, you know, he's, if he's unwilling to be a part of a political party, he's also unwilling to be part of a school of thought. So that may, that may not make you happy. <laughs> In Burke, what is kind of his take on Burke? Just kind of you know, he like, never wrote about Burke. Yeah, that's interesting, yeah. And he doesn't care much about that. Not really, no. Yeah. So. No. Because all of like the authors so far in the class, they always kind of refer back to Burke. You know, we have like Nisbet, like uh, Kirk. No. Yeah, but kind of, kind of like old shots. Kind of. He's not a duck. No, he's not. Yeah. <laughs> yes. This might be like a little bit of a stretch, but if Oakchad is saying that his conservatism is where change is an emblem of extinction, would he say that his conservatism is about attachment then? He would advocate for things that we're already attached to, is what we're going. Well, um, remember there's this line. I think it's in the on the conservative on um, the He says it's not stay with me because you are so beautiful, but stay with me because I am attached to you. So it is this kind of familiarity and attachment. Um, it's sort of what I was talking about with the, with the children. You know, it's not it's not that the child could never imagine a better home or a better place, but. This is what I have. This is my my set of circumstances, and I'm unwilling to give those up. Um, it's and, and for that reason, I'm attached to them. Yeah, I think that's right. Maybe one more question, and then we'll break for ten minutes. Wait. So let me ask you this: attractive figure, not attractive. Things you like, don't like. <laughs> Yes. I like the idea of conservatism as a disposition because it doesn't seem as tribal to me. Like I've uh, something that's always rubbed me the wrong way a lot is is that the need to categorize yourself and really pin yourself down, and he doesn't seem to want to do that, which I kind of like. Yes, he's not tribal, um, and I and I do think what one of the things he's objecting to in modern politics is that we really are tribal, uh, and people were tribal in his day too. He doesn't want to be part of. It. He doesn't want to be forced to be part of a tribe. Uh, he would rather think for himself. I mean, there's a whole side of Oakshot that is very, as much as he's, he, you know, he says he's a conservative and on being conservative, but he's also an individualist. He's very interested in what people choose to do with their lives and the decisions they make, and he wants them to be free to be able to do that. You know, be told what to do. So yes, you're absolutely right. Well, thank you all for some very good questions. Thank you. Thank you.